Barrow calls for concerted efforts in supporting victims as, uh, as he addresses the nation following Wednesday's devastating windstorm that caused destruction to lives and properties. The Vice President, Dr. Issa Toure, engages opinion leaders, youth and women on peaceful coexistence and irregular migration as she tours the nation. The Director General of GRTS calls on the Governor of Upper River Region during his familiarization tour meant to assess staff welfare and general operations of the national broadcaster. Plus, the people of South Sudan calls on the government to prioritize attaining lasting peace as the country marks its 10th anniversary. And police in Haiti say a 28-member hit squad comprising American and Colombians are allegedly behind the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. All that and much more coming ahead in the news with me by Ibrahim Cham, many thanks for joining us. Many thanks for joining us. The President, His Excellency Adam Abaro, has called for inclusiveness and concerted efforts in supporting victims of Wednesday's night's windstorm as they rebuild their lives and livelihoods. The President made the remarks in his address to the nation as the country reels from the devastating effects of the storm that claimed 10 lives, leaving a trail of destruction behind. The Gambian leaders stressed the need to strengthen disaster risk reduction mechanisms in the country and further called on the youths and all able-bodied citizens to engage in agriculture as a business venture. President Barrow also extended heartfelt condolences to their bereaved families and prayed for the speedy recovery of all those injured. Let's listen to this excerpt. Fellow Gambians and residents, these are challenging times for us as a nation. As a predominant farming country, we always look forward to the rainy season with excitement. However, we are also conscious that the season may come with some natural disasters. As the rainy season starts this year, we are beginning to experience short unfortunate calamities. Last Wednesday night's thunderstorm accompanied by lightning and heavy winds that downed electric poles, destroyed buildings, uprooted trees, and littered our streets and communities with debris. Above all, it is most regrettable that our report recorded 10 deaths across the country due to the storm. On behalf of the government and the entire nation, I commiserate with all those affected directly or indirectly. In particular, I extend heartfelt condolences to the brief families for the sad loss of lives. And I pray for solace for those who suffer damage to property. In the same vein, I pray for the speedy recovery of all those injured and their loved ones who perish in the storm to rest in eternal peace. I wish to inform all citizens and residents of the country that my government is fully aware of the scale of the damage caused by this natural tragedy. We have since taken immediate steps to redress the situation. Working with the National Disaster Agency, NDMA, and the relevant line institutions, the government has activated the country's emergency preparedness and response plan. The National Disaster Management Agency staff deployed around the country are working tirelessly to assess the full extent of the damage, and they are instituting measures to mitigate the effect of this natural disaster. Based on an NDMA preliminary assessment report, the storm destroyed property worth millions of dollars and injured many people, apart from claiming 10 lives. I appeal to all citizens and residents, all corporate bodies, and our development partners to work with the NDMA on disaster risk mechanisms and support the victims. 
That was uh, President Adam Obaro there addressing the nation on Wednesday's devastating wind storm that destructed lives and properties across the country. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Management Agency has today called on a emergency called an emergency meeting with its partners following the heavy wind storm that has caused a massive destruction across the country. As I educator reports, the purpose was to assess the damage caused and possible areas of support. In the eyes of many, it is one of the most devastating incidents of recent, leaving a trail of destruction behind. The windstorm has affected the lives and livelihoods of multitudes of people. Some people died and many more are still looking for shelter. Wednesday, the 7th of July, is certainly one of those dark days that will go down in the annals of the country's history. Across all spectrums was a windstorm and pictures of massive loss. The response was swift and diverse. The foremost disaster management agency in the country, the National Disaster Management Agency, took the lead by convening an emergency meeting with key stakeholders, including the United Nations bodies, to discuss the unfortunate development we are in a state of serious crisis, but as of now, 3,114 people have been affected with 1,531 internally displaced. Government cannot do it alone. We know uh, the, 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 the poverty situation in this country. This is why we call our partners to come and join us and brief them of the situation with regard to the, on the 7th um, of July windstorm which we all know ravaged almost the entire country. The stakeholders' meeting was convened to assess the magnitude of what has happened since the beginning of the year. The Garden also discussed best possible ways of seeking support from development partners for adequate and better response. We are, you know, selected number of UN agencies, um, WFP, UNICEF, IOM, UNDP, FAO, UNFPA, and UNCDF. So we are together and we are discussing how to support the government in the preparedness and response. So after this meeting, we will brief the colleagues and then we discuss what to do, okay? Also, NGO colleagues here, I recognize the different NGO colleagues are also taking action and ready to act. So looking forward to working with you. At the meeting, the NDMA presented a situational report highlighting the death toll, injuries, displaced persons and structural damages caused by the windstorm to its partner institutions. This meeting was preceded by a nationwide engagement by the NDMA on destructions caused by the windstorm since the start of the rainy season. Described by many as timely, the forum provided stakeholders the opportunity to gather first-hand information on response and mitigation capabilities of disaster response agencies. Stakeholder partners at the meeting suggested for a joint detailed assessment, resource mobilization and strengthening of cooperation among stakeholders. These, according to stakeholders, will help to boost community resilience against the adverse effects of torrential rains and windstorms. For GRTS News, this is Isa Tukaita. The Vice President, Dr. Aisha Toure, on Friday continued her second leg of her nationwide sensitization tour, engaging opinion leaders, youth and women on peace and peaceful coexistence and irregular migration in Birkama, West Coast region, to promote dialogue among the various actors. Irajalo reports. The tour is aimed to promote dialogue among actors in the area of peace building and the maintenance of stability and promote the active involvement and participation of the decentralized structures, the widen peace building programs coverage and ensure community accountability of programs and their participation in program implementation. Vice President Ture also urged Gambians to desist from stigmatizing and discriminating the returnees upon their return to the Gambia Adding attitude can make such returnees confuse and make them venture into things that can undermine the peaceful nature of the country. Dr. Ture stressed the need for opinion leaders to take the challenge for the advancement of their desired goals. She also added that the maintenance of peace and stability should be everyone's business irrespective of our tribal and political differences. The Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, Gloriana Cole, said provision of schools and second chance education are all made possible due to the peaceful conditions prevailing in the country and urge citizenry to embrace and prioritize all their endeavors.
The Minister of Agriculture, Ami Fabre, said the West Coast region has benefited a lot from her ministries, such as the provision of farm implements to maximize their production and disclose that the root project aims to support youth in agricultural sector and urge them to apply for the project through their regional directorate. She so calling youths to take the opportunities provided by the current administration as this will help them to make it in the Gambia and this is from actions that can ignite violence and irregular migration. Other speakers include Deputy Permanent Secretary's Office of the Vice President and the Interior, Sehu Tarawale and Fanta Bojang Samatamani, respectively, urge parents to instill in their families the significance of peace, stressing that no development can take place in the absence of peace and stability. For his part, the Governor of West Coast Region, Lamin Sani, hailed the government for the tour, describing it as timely and important, especially at a time when the country is preparing for the forthcoming national elections. Dito continues. For GRTS News, this is Yero Jalo reporting. In another development, the Gambia Youth Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with the Gambia Women's Chamber of Commerce, on Friday launched the third edition of the National Youth and Women Agribusiness and Tourism Trade Fair 2021 in Banjul. The aim of the initiative is to promote and increase networking opportunities and businesses income for women and youth. Janke Ture tells us more. With the view to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on youth and women in medium, small and micro enterprises, MSMEs, through market linkages and networking for improved sustainability, the Gambia Youth Chamber of Commerce and the Gambia Women Chamber of Commerce has launched a detailed edition of the National Youth and Women Agribusiness and Tourism Trade Fair. The fair, which will be the third of its coin, according to officials, is expected to take place on the 28th of October to 14th November 2021. This is just done to, to pull forces together to better provide more services, especially during the post-COVID or um, during the COVID crisis that we face today. The markets are never enough. The platforms will be never enough for young entrepreneurs. Even if we were supposed to organize 10, I'm very sure all of them will be willing to participate, to take part, and ensure that they're able to network, but again, expand their, uh, the opportunities of um, getting more and more revenues to recover from the post-COVID impacts. Nafi Bauri, the president of Gambia Women Chamber of Commerce, highlighted the significance of trade fair. Key among them is to create networking. Madam Barry called on Gambians to come out and support the endeavor which is aimed at supporting women and youth. 67% of the population are youth. Now, if you combine that, and we're talking about the whole population then, indeed, therefore, this joint operation of bringing youth and women together to showcase their potential is very, very important and timely. We know the entrepreneurship ecosystem is big, but markets in this country is always a challenge. That's why uh, the ITC, through uh, one of our big projects, which is uh, She Trades, focuses a lot in terms of connecting women entrepreneurs uh, with markets where they'll be able to sell their products. The trade fair targets 300 businesses across the country. The president of GYCC, Ismaila Sambu, highlighted the impact of COVID-19 on businesses, adding that the trade fair will provide market space for women and youth. The COVID-19 outbreak creating a more even Troubling economic environment. Thus, many are expected to enter the unemployment and find it difficult to secure jobs. Inspired by the Gambia Youth Chamber of Commerce and the Gambia Women Chamber of Commerce, shared commitment to provide market space, promote and give support to youth and women agribusiness and the tourism sector in the Gambia. In his luncheon statement, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Trade, Ibrahim Asisao, commended the two groups for coming together to organize such an important platform while giving his ministry support to this endeavor. We will continue to work with them and provide them with the support. And I think they will be a role model for more women to get into areas that are considered as male-dominated. Uh, because uh, once the ministry is able to support out those kind of um, initiatives, we will always be there to support, to, 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 the, uh, to make sure that they stand on their feet. The Gambia Youth Chamber of Commerce, GYCC, 
is the umbrella body and voice of young entrepreneurs in the Gambia. It is a youth-led trade support organization established to support MSMEs with a view to connect them with appropriate business environment and market opportunities to boost income. Janke Ture, GRTS News. The Director General of the Gambia Radio and Television Services, Malik Jeng, and top officials of the public broadcaster are on a familiarization tour of GRTS facilities across the country. The tour is also meant to assess staff welfare and general operations. The delegation is on Thursday held engagements with the Governor of the Upper River Region. Seydou Kama reports from Basse. Top officials of the Gambia Radio and Television Services, accompanied by board members, are visiting the public broadcaster facilities across the country to gather further information on the state of affairs of the site. The tour is led by the Director General Malik Jeng, and it is perhaps his first public engagement outside Banjul. In the Upper River region, the visiting delegation paid a courtesy call on Governor Sambaba to brief him on their mission. Governor Sambaba expressed delight in receiving the top officials of the national broadcaster. He also expressed satisfaction and the oppression of GRTS in content programming and news production. So it is always important. That is why there are programs that are existing in this region. I monitor it on a daily basis. Even if there is no electricity and it is time for news at 6, I call them. I say, what is happening? Because I want to know uh, what is happening in Banjul. Because there should be connection. And it is the radio and television that connects us. Because if you looked at it, it's almost like 480 something miles or kilometers away from Banjul. So, but the programs that you do in Banjul over there, if you listen to them here, it means that we are in Banjul altogether. Governor Ba challenged the management of GRTS to provide a perimeter fence for the bus station and among other concerns. We have some constraints and that is with regards to the electricity tank God that uh, you came to the office, governor's office and the same problem faced you. That is electricity going on and on, off and the radio is connected to electricity. Definitely we would love if the electricity thing will be solved at the radio, particularly Radio Basse. Radio Basse is been listening to CRR and even in the Senegal end. If there is a program here, people will be calling from Senegal, what you call to acknowledge what the radio is doing. The Director General Malik Jeng, responding earlier said, those concerns and many other matters necessitated the visit to get further information on the state of affairs and general welfare of the staff. This is a, a familiarization fact-finding mission that we decided to embark on to enable me to see, as a new director, to see the GRTS GRT facilities up country, to, to assess the condition of our equipment, mainly because we have six transmitter stations up country. Uh, we have Aboko, Kanilai, Mansakonko, Kudang, Bansang, and Base. So we wanted to see the state of the equipment to see if some of them need, need replacing and hopefully to approach government to, 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 to do this. DJ Jiang thanked the office of the governor for the support given to the buses substation and assured him that the management will look into those concerns. I was concerned that the, there were, you know, the, 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 I think I would call them squatters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you had all kinds of shops and um, corrugated st structures. And I was just wondering, and Abubakar said, well, this is our land actually. I said, I think we should, we should fence it. Yeah. So I think we'll definitely discuss this at management level, take it up to the board, and I think it is, yes, it is important that we fence this property. So everybody knows it's GRTS, at least it will protect our staff from, as you say, um, reptiles and stuff like that. GRTS board members Mala Ebas and Abdullah Pui, respectively, expressed delight during their intervention. The pleasing and the encouraging words from the governor is really, I think, a source of inspiration. And we at the board level and the policy level, I think we are encouraged more. And we are going to do extra. We've been doing, but we're going to work extra harder. Because listening to this encouragement we are getting, uh, I think it's a source of real, real inspiration. We are here to collaborate. We are here to also, you know, know what are the things that are happening on the ground and also be able to go back and see how best we can come up with tangible solutions to help uplift the welfare of staffs and also the equipments or the transmitters that we have 
so that uh, the entire country will be at liberty to have the RTS at their doorstep. The fact-finding mission by senior officials of the public broadcaster is a timely one following its recent transition to digital broadcasting, a move that the citizenry are embracing with a degree of enthusiasm. Saido Kamara reporting for the RTS News from Basse Upper Time now to take our first break. When we return, we will take a look at news from beyond our borders. Do stay with us. Welcome back. As it marks its 10th anniversary, many South Sudanese are now asking the government to prioritize attaining lasting peace for the country. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports from Juba. Established 21 years ago by Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, the East African community has grown in leaps and bounds. In November 1999, the three countries signed a treaty establishing the community, which came into force in July 2000. The revival was really an admission, we made a mistake. And since we made a mistake, can we correct it? The mistake was the dissolution of the East African community in 1977, following disagreements among partner states. In the last 14 years, the ESC's membership has grown. In 2007, Rwanda and Burundi became members, with South Sudan joining the community in 2016. At present, the ESC has a population of about 177 million people, with a combined GDP of $193 billion. Despite several hitches over the years, a lot has been achieved. In 2001, the East African Legislative Assembly and the East African Court of Justice were inaugurated. Four years later, in 2005, the ESC Customs Union became operational, and in 2010, the ESC Common Market Protocol came into force. They made progress towards having a customs union, although it has its own challenges. It's, uh, still not fully operating as a, a customs union. But you can have goods moving, uh, duty-free, uh, quarter-free within the region. And uh, so there is a free trade area working. Other milestones include a protocol for the establishment of a monetary union set to come into force in 2023 and the first striking of a process towards a federation. These, together with a customs union and a common market, make up the four pillars that the union's foundations are based on. The latest country seeking to join the East African community is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if admitted on paper at least, that would make the East African community one of the largest economic blocks on the continent. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> Haitian police say a 28-member hit squad made of American and Colombians were behind the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. First, there was an attack on Moise's private residence in Port-au-Prince. has plunged the nation into political crisis. Details in this report. This assassination started the power struggle, uh, which is coming as a crisis on top of several other crises we had in this country. Uh, remember, uh, two days before the president was assassinated, his prime minister resigned to take uh, to give his position to a new prime minister. Uh, the prime minister who resigned is Claude Joseph. He is now in charge of the government. The prime minister, the new prime minister, his name is Ariel Henry, and he was in the process of putting together his cabinet when the president was assassinated. And he is now saying, you know, I am the real prime minister. I am the one who is supposed to run the country. And you have the international community uh, in, in, in uh, right now who are sending uh, messages that are somewhat infuriating to the political class, to a large swath of the political class right now. Because what they are saying is Claude Joseph should stay in power all the way until we have elections in this country. But the problem is, uh, if you talk to human rights organizations, if you talk to a civil grassroots, uh, civil society organization, what they will tell you is having election right now in Haiti is practically insane. 
uh, other countries are condemning the report. As I stated, uh, Colombia is trying to help Haiti uh, to track down information uh, which would go to the killers to know a little bit more about their motives and who uh, allegedly uh, contracted them to assassinate the president because that's, I mean, the big question. Who? Uh, had an interest in killing the president. I mean, a lot of people had, but who effectively paid these guys to do it? Um, and uh, Venezuela condemned it, uh, saying it's an attack to um, the democracy in Haiti. I mean, the U.S. condemned it, but at the same time, these countries, I mean, the U.S. and uh, the United Nations, they are calling for elections. But the problem is you have an insecurity climate uh, that uh, do not permit to think that you can have free and fair election. The large swath of the country is being controlled by gangs, and these gangs are so powerful that they are more armed than the police officers. So how can you have an election, a free and fair election, in a situation like that? Uh, we'll be back with sports news right after this break. Welcome back. From Birkama Nevertan to the third and second tier football, and now a milestone achievement in the top tier football. Fortune Football Club are crowned champions of the Gambia Football Federation Division 1 League with three games to spare. The Petroleum Boys defeated second place Walidan 2 1 at the Independence Stadium to sit comfortably at the top. Pamela Baye has been following the league and now tells us more. If there is anything Fortune deserves this season, it's the title. It was unexpected after a few games in the league. The Petroleum boys work so hard for their success. The dynamic of their team is no match to the rest. They remain the most consistent team in the league with 12 wins, 10 draws, and a single defeat in 23 games, scoring 23 goals and conceding just 7. This was indeed a remarkable title-winning performance by Jan Juve's team. This class against Walidan was one game for Fortune to eventually prove their superiority over the rest of the teams, and they proved it with a hard for 2 one win. Walidan stayed resolute for the most part, knowing that aside from a win, will mean that they will have to fight for the second and the remaining places in the standings, even though Fortune first took the lead courtesy of Patrick Silva's goal. From that moment, Fortune was on course for a win until when drama unfolded in stoppage time as two late goals were scored. Alaji Kamara scored in the 93rd minute to draw Waliden back on level terms. At that moment, it looked more like a draw between the two sides. But there was still time for Fortune to score a late winner as Sibosanyam fired home a free kick in the last minute of the game to earn his side a 2-1 win. That stunning free kick crowned Fortune as the champions of Gambian football. A journey that began in Nyomi, before leading to Farato and then Birkama, to the very top of Gambian football. Fortune finished fifth and fourth respectively in their first two seasons in the top tier of Gambian football. And now they are champions. A remarkable achievement and a roller coaster journey for the team from Farato, powered by the petroleum money, has now joined the elite ranks of Gambian clubs. Fortune were are not just fortunate, they worked so hard for their success, invested wisely in building a formidable side, which has conquered and reigned supreme in Gambian football. Farmer Abadi, GRTS News. Before we end this newscast, a quick look at our top stories. President Adam Obaro has called for concerted efforts in supporting victims as he addresses the nation following Wednesday's devastating windstorm that caused destruction to lives and property. Vice President Dr. Aysa Toure have been engaging opinion leaders, youth and women on peaceful coexistence and irregular migration as she toured the nation. The Director General of GRTS has called on the Governor of the Upper River Region during their familiarization tour meant to assess staff welfare and general operations of the National Broadcaster. 
Plus, the people of South Sudan has called on the government to prioritize attaining lasting peace as the country marks its 10th anniversary. And police in Haiti have said that a 28-member hit squad comprising of American and Colombians are allegedly behind the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. That was all we had in this edition of GRTS News. Many thanks for watching. Please enjoy the rest of our programs.